What's up, everybody? TJ here. Real quick before we get started with the episode, I'm testing out a new feature called Fan Mail, which is where you can actually text me from the episode that you're listening to. So as you're listening to this, go over to the episode description and right there at the beginning, you're going to see some text that says, send me a text message. Go ahead, click that. Let me know what you think about the podcast so far. Let me know of any questions, concerns, anything you might have. I love to hear from you. So go ahead, hit that up. I'm excited to read your text and let's get started with the episode. Hey, everybody, before we dive into this episode, I just wanted to be fully transparent. This is the second time I recorded with Dave. The first time we did it, it was more of a therapy session because A, we hadn't seen each other in a while and B, we started uncovering quite a few traumatic events that we had been through individually and together. And so while we got good audio bits, it was more of a conversation around the kitchen table, conversation around a bonfire, just almost like a bullshit session, if you will, where we just got it all out there. We vented. And what you're about to hear is the result of venting the way that we did, because it's a much tighter episode. We covered everything that we wanted to cover, and I think you're thoroughly going to enjoy it. So stay tuned for part one of Dave Smith's episode. I've never had suicidal ideations, but I 100% understand why people get there. Because when you're in that spot, when your brain is freaking out and you're just really low in that spot, it feels like you're never getting out of it. And that is your reality now. And it'll never get better. You feel uniquely broken. You feel uniquely alone. I can understand why some guys choose that route. But it's a shame... Welcome to the Keep the Promise podcast, where we help build resilient and well-rounded firefighters. What's up, everybody? Welcome to the Keep the Promise podcast. Today, I have the honor and the pleasure of hanging along a good and old friend of mine. Dave and I have known each other since I started in the volunteer fire service back in 05. And throughout the years, we've been on quite a few adventures, a lot of misadventures. We've raised a ton of money for charity. I mean, he pinned me when I graduated the fire academy. So we've been kind of thick as thieves for a good long while. And he has a story that not only everybody needs to hear, but I am confident that will resonate with many of you because especially the September being... Suicide Safety Awareness Month and our really heavy focus on mental health and uh, mental health issues within the fire service. His story and how he overcame some obstacles in life is going to be one for you, not just to remember, but to take notes on and use as an example. So without further ado, my good friend, Dave Smith. Dave, welcome to the show. Welcome back. Okay, welcome back. Yeah, no. We um we had a bit of a of an issue on the on the first recording, but we got a lot of stuff for reels. I appreciate you coming out here to yeah, no um, problem. to keep the promise global headquarters in the middle of what's supposed to be a hurricane, but feels more like a drizzle. Yes, sir. So let's get started with just your life in the fire service. Tell me when you started, where you started, and where you are these days. I started out at the Bel Air Volunteer Fire Company in summer of 2001. And as we all know, that was a extremely formative year in the fire service. Yeah. Uh, and that very, very much solidified my desire to, you know, be a paid fireman, a big city fireman, and applied, you know, I, I, shit, I applied it. New York FDMY at Baltimore at Howard at PGA at DC, you know, everywhere. And you know, it took about six years, but finally got hired in DC. But prior to that, I did some time at the Hyattsville uh, Volunteer Fire Department in Prince George's. So I was a live in there from fall, like winter of 03 to around 2007 when I got hired with a uh, Washington DC Fire Department. Did 10 years as a uh, 
on the side of a ladder truck there and then got my promotion to truck driver technician uh been doing that for about six years now so coming on 17 years in the dc fire department and i'm i'm a truck guy i'm bad at math so like 20 22, 22 years altogether in the, in the in the fire service yeah we um we met when when i joined you by that point we had four years at at Bel Air, and I think you were you're rappelling off the side of a mezzanine with a with a BA showing a bailout technique. I think you got in trouble for that one for scuffing. Yeah, I got, in, got in trouble for a lot of stuff, but I think we all did, buddy. All, all fun stuff. It was all fun. I mean, looking back at some of those people that that we spent time with, it's um, there are often times that I wish we could just rewind and go back to those easier, funner days. Yeah, because it was. I mean, we were in, right. We were invincible. We were just going to fires, doing fun stuff. Nothing mattered. Put stereos in the fire engines and right. blasted music. And then you also cut your teeth in in Hyattsville with some. I mean, with some near dear friends of mine, like Nate, and um, and also during a time when that place was hopping. Yeah, that uh, first like six seven months living there. No, uh, we, I remember in the summertime, we, or, yeah, summertime when guys were getting ready to kind of go home for the summer, so, you know, cause it's a lot of guys are doing there for college and stuff like that. And we went through the journals and we had like, it was like 60 some good fires. Like not just like, we didn't even count like a small room off or, you know, whatever it was like legit good fires and probably like two dozen pretty good extrications and so it was definitely a, uh we learned a whole lot really fast which you know coming back to you know the bel air fire department that kind of made an issue because you know you're a young guy who's been on a whole lot of incidents and a lot of people look at younger people as you shouldn't be teaching or telling people or showing people how to do stuff because you're just a young guy but you know it's and that's a, I mean, it's a fire service culture thing in general. It's that whole, well, he's got less time on than me. Who should this get? You know, it's the people think that just having time in a department means that they are kind of worthy of respect or, you know, all that. Where, hey, it kind of depends what you put into it. You know, like there's people with three and five years on the job who've put a whole lot more effort and went to trainings and, do stuff on their own time and you know they just haven't just collected a paycheck for you know 20 years and you know they're so that's that's sorry about going on that tangent no i like it because we we were all on the receiving end of um on the bad receiving end of that we um culturally at least at the time in that place in that county it was very frowned upon to take the initiative or to try to change things yeah like i remember a, an elected officer which is written like not a promoted officer and elected so somebody who won the popularity contest saying that he didn't want to lay in supply lines or pull attack lines because then we'd have to re-rack them yeah like that i mean that was just a difference in culture like you know when i was in living at hyattsville if you know we yeah, i mean this was pre social media and all that but if somebody had taken a class or did something and came back and said, Hey, this is a new way. Some other department was talking about racking a hose line. And we would literally pull the engine out, dump the hose, move the dividers in the hose bed, rack it, pull it a couple of times and then put it back the way we had it just to see if, hey, see if it worked. we liked it. No, you know, like why not? Like it was a good environment to try stuff. And you'd had a lot of people from, you know, and that's a, good thing with pg fire department was or the live-in community was people from you know all over the country were there like we had a guy from alaska and a lot of guys from new york from guy from minnesota uh south carolina so just you know kind of had a little bit of everybody there and you know a lot of career guys with different departments coming in and sharing that knowledge with a young guy trying to become a career guy and that's so important because it lays that foundation to have that open mindedness when it goes into the fire service. It's like you said, it, it's easy for us to kind of go and get hired, go with the flow, collect a paycheck, just 
be an employee. It's different being an employee and a fireman, if that makes sense. It- yeah. Well, I mean, it, you know, I, I like to say, like, I, I don't personally care if somebody considers it just a job. I'm fine with that. But the difference is they have to be good at that job. Yeah, like if they're not all into the job and doing stuff and taking training and, you know, reading stuff and talking to people and, you know, excited about it, I'm cool with it. But you have to still have to be competent at it. All right. If you don't if you don't perform on the fire ground, then there's an issue. But it's right. those I, I actually I love some of those because look, trust me, gung ho, like did all the classes, went to all the places, and I thought that was that was right. That's a way to become a good fireman. And there were still those people who would show up on scene after, you know, just doing the, the basics and still had performing. And I was like, all right, damn, I can't say anything to these guys. Yeah. I mean, and, and it also feeds into after the fire department, right? Like the guys who, you know, it's an unfortunate thing, but sometimes you see it where people, retire and pass away shortly after because they didn't they didn't make a differentiation between themselves and the fire department and outside of the fire department life like working overtime and not going to your niece's karate class or missing a, one of the kids like you know last school le, last or school play yeah. or football game because well, I could get some more money like you know whatever like that is it, you're not going to get that stuff back like the fire department we'll fill your spot the next list. They don't care. So like having that community outside of the fire department and having important stuff in your life where it's not defining you as a firefighter. Like I've had that conversation with a couple guys who've been, you know, medically disabled or, you know, and really struggle with it. And, you know, it's, or, you know, if somebody resigns to move on to something else, I'm first one to tell them good luck, stay in touch, you know, reach out if you need anything. I'm not like, oh, he's a quitter. You know, fuck that guy. You know, it's it's. Hey, man, that, that's it's not the end all be all. Like, I love the job. I love doing it. It's giving me a lot, but at the end of the day, it, it kind of is still just a profession. Like, yeah, you you know, you can be passionate about it. You can be great at it. You know, whatever. But you know, it pays the bills for a lot of us. But also, people, some people, a lot of people, also are volunteers, which. Hats off to them. You know, we all, we, we both used to do it, mm-hmm. but you know, it's very important to have that. Like, but even then some of the volunteers that, you know, we know where the firehouse is the priority over top of their family and stuff. <laughs> and and, and <laughs> yeah, like, it's like, seen. it's like, it's great, but it also is, you know, it's a detriment to your life outside of that. Like when, when it's taken away from you, like, you know, guys have that, like, that's all I was or that's all I'm worth or I'm not worth anything if I'm not a firefighter and doing that and being involved. And it's, it's very important. To it's that fine line of being proficient, but also not making it the whole identity. And I've been so lucky to talk to people like you, like my buddy Nick from up in Upper Darby, who are, I mean, Dave Angelo as well. Like all, right. all of these very wise folks who talk about the importance of, hey, be a good, competent firefighter. However, do not make that your whole identity because what are you going to be left with when it's gone? When you can't be riding that fire truck and going on calls. We saw, I mean, we saw it all the time. There were living at the volley houses who would get in trouble for whatever dumb thing. And now they're homeless. They have nothing to occupy their time with. They don't have any place to go, anybody to be with because their entire lives had been given to a firehouse. It's just kind of sad. Well, I mean, it, it can, I mean, it, that's a lot of, you know, a lot of like addiction type stuff where you're filling a void, you're doing something to distract yourself. You're doing something that occupies you, that makes you feel good. You know, some people it's alcohol, some people it's drugs, some people it's, you know, working out and being obsessive about that. Some people it's, you know, my job and they get, overly invested and tied up in it and that's their you know their job is their escape and it's their time off is where things are things are weird where i just i'd rather be at work you know because 
it makes sense at work. I know who I am at work. I'm in charge of this or I'm a lieutenant or, you know, at work, I'm the engine driver here and people respect me, but at home, I'm just me, you know, like it's, so some people also kind of struggle with that about like, right. I remember when I was at 10 with, with Nate, with Stone, um, I went through a nasty breakup and he made the comment. He's like, you're about to become one of the best employees that we have. I'm like, right. what do you mean? Cause you know, I had like a couple years on and the dude's been a mentor my whole life. He's like, dude, your home life is going to be such a mess that you are just going to be so happy and so driven when you come here. And now I found myself saying that to some of the no- newer folks. It's like, oh, break up, divorce, cool. Like, you're about to be firefighter of the year. All right. So talk to me about DC. You guys are a very traditional department. One thing that I admire is that you've been at the same house your entire career. Yeah, it can be a good and a bad thing. You know, it's it's unheard of for us. Well, I, I you know, like I just, I, I do a lot of... Uh, teaching at the academy for you know recruit classes and also like in service companies and stuff but for the recruits you know i always am kind of telling them especially when it's kind of towards the end of graduation that it doesn't matter where you're going to get assigned to buddy like just you know whether it's a quote-unquote cool firehouse or it's a quote-unquote bad firehouse that's irrelevant like it's you can be at a slow station and enjoy every minute of your 24 hours or you can be at a busy station and hate working there because you just don't gel with coworkers or it's just not, you know, there's personality conflicts or whatever. So, you know, being around good people makes a huge difference. Like enjoying the time with your coworkers, enjoying what you do, being excited to go to work matters, you know, versus, you know, quote unquote, a cool house or whatever. And you might not have a, you know, it might not enjoy it. And then, you know, once probation's over, hey, you can put your transfer form in if it's not working for you. But, like, don't don't get all upset if – plus, there's, like, no rhyme or reason to it. It's not, like – I think, like, the top person in our class got sent to one of the, like, holy crap, you went to that firehouse. You know, like, there, no there, yeah, there, there's no, like, picking and choosing where people are like that. It, that's another ebb and flow. Sometimes you can request people. Sometimes they just plug them in wherever, and there's no no say to it. Um, but yeah, you know, my firehouse, when I got there, it was, it was a lot of, uh, I mean, it was easy cause we had borders with, uh, Montgomery and they were right kind of, we have, we're kind of a Northern border company. So we have the kind of the street grid system goes out into Hyattsville. So I kind of knew a lot of the streets pretty much okay. and it kind of made sense. And it was more or less the way PG operated was similar to how DCS. So it was basically just like, all right, now I'm getting paid to do this. Um, you know, like, but when I got there, like the, they didn't have a company patch. There wasn't, you know, there was not a whole lot of, you know, pride in the house. So like, I just, you know, kind of bided my time a little bit. And then as I had a little bit more time on, you know, Hey, came up with the company patch, you know, painted, you know, tried to keep the tools painted and tried to, uh, to do stuff like when I got my driver job, I gave everybody in the company a little, you know, uh, helmet sticker, the patch, and you know, car decal and stuff, just to kind of like force some guy, you know, kind of yeah, keep not, the not, of core up. not not force it, but to like, hey, now you have this, yeah, go ahead and do it. Like that was something my uh, one of my last lieutenants uh, got me into doing was, you know, we have the the whole shift has the same shield and. We had a, you know, he said like, "Hey, have when you order one for you know the lieutenant, order two of them, and then when you get a new lieutenant, hey, you're here, welcome. Here's a shield, so you look like us, and it kind of gives that buy-in of like, oh, these guys actually kind of care about it, and like, you know, we all have the, <clears throat> you know, our shift, we all have a little horseshoe on the helmet for our little." adopted pony that we have that we go visit you know we don't have to use horse-drawn fire apparatus anymore right you don't need to deal with horses yeah but it's fun we have diesel now nah and it's uh, like that's one of the things like you know guys guys give me a hard time about it work and it's I, we just don't care it's like whatever man it's you know it's it's it doesn't bother me but it's like uh you know it started out we were just driving you know checking stuff out and you know holy shit there's a there's a stable in our in our response district. 
Hmm. So we, you know, walking around and uh, we're like, uh, so what do you want us to do if this is on fire? Because this is like a pretty, you know, there's 40 some horses. There's a big, uh, <clears throat> you know, hay loft and everything. Oh, and it's like kind of in the woods. And it's like, this is a kind of a unique hazard for big city firefighting. So let's see. You know, so <laughs> you know, kind of form a relationship with them. And then yeah, it just got to be, we're like, it's a nice day. Let's just swing by, get pet the ponies and hang out for a little bit. You know, there's little kids having camps and riding lessons and stuff and, you know, get out of the firehouse, drive around, do some fun stuff. And so we try to pop in every once in a while and we got our little sugar-free treats because the, the one of the horses is diabetic. So got to make sure we have the sugar-free. I didn't even know horses could get di- was diabetes just gonna say, that, but yep. Um, I grew up in a third world country where we had all those, you know, horses, animals, stuff like that. Never knew. Right. Never knew that. Um, let's so see. So what's the name of the pony? Uh, it's my girl Nutmeg. No, I was going to, I was going to say chestnut. I knew it had some, some close, sort of close, close, but, uh, uh, yeah. So, I mean, um, back to you know, career in DC, it's, you do, you know, as a backstep, so Engine companies, that's a one of those tr- DC tradition things. Backstep, you know, is a, refers to the engine company because you used to ride on the tailboard of the engine, so that was the back step of the wagon. If you're signed to a truck company, you're called you're on the side of the truck company because they used to ride on the side of the you know the the trailer of the tiller truck. They used to just kind of hang out and sit up on there and sit on the side and hold on. So that's kind of one of those like terminology things, and like we do. Uh, you know, we, people get pretty adamant about if you call it a fire station, people get really mad about that because it's a firehouse. Cause, mm-hmm. And like, and, and a, you know, like I was, I told my one engine driver, I'm sorry, my engine driver, we had a conversation about that. And I was like, it, it terminology does matter to an extent because like a fire station is a place you work at. A firehouse is a place you live. So you have pride in where you live because it's your house. Stuff like, you know, he'd say like, oh, we're doing chores. I'd be like, no, nah, we're doing housework. It's not chores. It's housework because we're cleaning our house up. You know, and like stuff like that. Like, you know, some of those little terminology things and like the, uh, uh, you know, we call it, we take runs. We don't take calls. And that's a utility rope not a rope hose tool and, and this, there's a lot of like the, you know, the old timers will really kind of lo- flip their wig if you it's know very culturally <laughs> ingrained yeah because well, there's a lot of that like this isn't the county you know they don't because you know like they'll <laughs> they'll yell at you if you use terminology from other departments and you're like i didn't even know that was from a different department bro i'm trying my best right um so you also you're uh when you're a fire just a firefighter you also have to do you know you're like most people, you're an EMT and a firefighter, so you're doing the ambulance rotations. And I did, when I first got on, was when they first kind of really started changing some stuff and adding some units. And we did four month stints on the ambulance, which was just brutal. And by the time that four months was over, if you were on there with your best friend, by the end of it, you were hating his guts because it's just just four (laughs) months of a transport unit in a you know big city it was just like just that don't make anybody miserable then they backed it down to like three months then it became one month then it was however you guys want to split it up so yeah you spend your time yeah it's i mean that's kind of fire service in general unless you're lucky enough to be in a place that doesn't have to do that good for you that's awesome (laughs) but most big cities are kind of going to that model or most departments because they get more bang for their buck by not just paying you to be a fireman. Uh, uh, let's see. And and you're on a tiller truck, right? Yeah, so it's all TDAs except for the tower ladder in, in D.C. I love it. I love it. We only have one. Yeah, every, I think we're going to a couple more. Yeah, everybody gives the tower a hard time. Why? I don't know. Is that one like Midnight Express? Is that what they are? Yeah, down by the by the White House. They're they're, they're good dudes. Though. It's a, I mean, it's a good resource, and it's just fun to give them a hard time because they're like the stepchild of the department that they don't have a tractor drawn <laughs> like everybody else. And 
Yeah, everybody. And so, you know, they kind of have the advantage of they're like automatically on all second alarms and, you know, they, so they kind of show up on all the fires. So a lot, of, say, a, lot, yeah. a, lot of, a lot of people get mad that they just kind of like, oh, there's the tower. I wonder why they're here. Like they just kind of, hey, it's a fire. Let's go, you know, and just start heading that way. Have they ever shown you up like positioning wise when you show up and you're like, fuck. No, nah, I mean, we're, we're far enough away from them where we'd never really run. That one time, I think number one shift, some, for some reason they were like in our area and ended up like first due on something. And I was like, cause I saw pictures and I was like, why the hell is a tower ladder in front of that building? And there's no explanation. Um, so at about 10 years, my truck driver retired or no, I'm sorry, he resigned, which is crazy. Cause he only had five years left to go. Did you call him a shit bag when he resigned? No, we desperately tried to tell him to do this five years. Just, just, just keep doing it. But at that point, he had already had 30 years in the fire service because he, he worked at uh, Fort Meade or Belvoir or something before that. Okay. And I think he was just done with it. So I was like, all right. So studied, got his spot. That was a that was a whole process because... I remember that. Yeah, at the time, it, it it's changed a bit, but at the time, it was... You know, so you take uh, in DC, you're expected to pretty much know your first two front and back. So you got to, you know, the test is, uh, you know, we have an information book that's every street and intersection, apartment building, number, verbatim, like left here, right there, left there, to the box, the short streets, so like the smaller streets that break up, like where they start, where they end, what's it between. And there's just like, Here's a blank line. This is this street. Draw all the streets that intersect with it or go through it, you know, by memory. So it's a pretty hard test. Uh, and it's done in house, right? Yeah. So that one's done in house. So the, the current technicians and kind of give the captain a bunch of stuff. Then he formulates it and puts it down. And I mean, I take unless you got a photographic memory, you know, I'm I'm an idiot. So. I can I can learn anything if I lock myself in a room and make my stuff st- study for you know six hours a day so and practice and you know that and like my old truck driver had told me he's like because I had, you know I'd taken a couple tests before that but just never did good you know never really put the effort in and he had said you know hey it, it, the person who wants it the most will get it so you know if you're not studying while you're in the bathroom deleting you know the social media app off your phone and replacing it with a study app and you know while football's going on you should be in the back of the room studying and you know flashcards and like when i was on the ambulance i was sitting there in the hospital parking lot doing stuff so it's you know and like you know looking back i remember you know a lot of you know, guys i really respect now that are were drivers or officers and they've moved up since then or were very like yeah, you're going to get that spot because they could just see, like, you know, you're sitting there drawing, you know, by memory on a, on the Sharpie, all the streets in the area and the apartment building numbers and all that. And then I, then I went to, after that, you go to the training school and it's a written test on like 15 different manuals. And at the time it was a 30 question test, which is ridiculous because that's like four questions wrong. You failed. Yeah, so you pass that, then you go outside, and it was a cone course that was very. It was and it still to this day frustrated me because it's that like the only thing in the fire department that was zero tolerance, pass, pass or fail. Like if the bulge of your tire touched a curb or the black part of the cone on the ground, you failed. And it was, you know, you're always supposed to have a backer. Ninety percent of the test is backing up, and you could. You couldn't stop and readjust. So it was like, you know, like doing the, doing the serpentine, it was like, you can't stop and pull forward. It's got to be in one shot and one shot only. Oh, and it's man. like, so I'm not going to get the reason I failed the first time. Yeah. yeah. Let's, let's not, let's yeah, not bring up that, 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 that painful that, that one. Uh, second time it was, we had, had a reserve for like three, four months. I didn't like that day before the test they said oh you got to use a truck that's similar to yours so i had to go like pick up a different ladder truck that morning and heading out the guy said hey if you have a chance the uh, officer side tire is low so that's by the ball just sticking out extra so of course 
that bulge touched a curb as I was coming around something, then, you know, so third time I got it, <clears throat> but definitely was a, uh, definitely was a challenge because, you know, and, you know, the, I remember our captain, you know, kind of gave me you know, some encouraging words because he's like, most guys would have just, you know, because if you fail there, everything resets. He posted, everybody has three weeks to, you know, three weeks to study again, take the test again, then a month. So it's like, you just reset the whole process. So it was like all together, like eight, nine months of just nonstop studying. And like, oh, God damn it, go back to the books, study for this, mm -hmm. this part again. All right, study for this part again. All right, get down there for driving again. So it was a... Uh, well, and I think going back to what he said, it's important for everybody listening to understand that it applies that whoever wants it the most is going to get it. Like you are guaranteed to fail. Like it's just a matter of how you recover from that and what you use to push you. Cause I was on the same boat as you flashcards and the ambulance. You know, I'm sitting there. I had gotten moved from what I thought was my cushy assignment being Mr. Badass cool guy to now writing a BLS unit way more than I had in my entire life and hating every second of it depending on who I had as a partner. And it was that conversation I had to have with myself of like, how badly do I want it? Like, is this, am I just going to be angry at my situation or can I use that to overcome and to move on to something more? And I too failed my first test and it was like a legit, a legit screw up. It was on the, on the practical. And I think we had like 30 people, take the test. And when the results came up, I was number 77 out of 30 mathematically. Like after all the scores got tallied, that's how badly I did the first time. And it was right. That two year wait. And you have that sort of like that weight on your shoulders. So you're like, all right, I can't, can't screw up again. Like same scenario. You're all those failures are in the back of your head. And it's, um, that's when you have to just like put your head down and and say, hey, do I want this bad enough or do I want that past failure to get to me? Yeah, I mean, it's it's definitely stressful. It is. And, you know, like uh, like with teaching at the academy, I, I try to input a little bit of the stuff I've learned with the recruits about because they do for their practical exams. They're evaluated by kind of like a third party evaluator. So there's like instructors, and then there's guys who give the test, but so, within the department, not like yeah, like department. like some some okay. people do both. But there's kind of like the guys who teach, and then there's the guys who come down for eight hours, sit there with a tablet, and check yes or no. But they also uh, they also no. GoPro videotape you while you're doing it. Oh, that's what's up. So I'm like, that's a pretty stressful environment for somebody that like yeah. a guy that you don't know is standing there with a the camera and. <laughs> All he's doing is reading this thing, and if he's there's no wiggle room for them, it's like the sheet says this, you failed. Period. Right. So you know, trying to help them with like, hey man, you know, just before you do it, you know, psych yourself up, do some mental preparedness, like think about what you're gonna do, you know, talk to yourself if you need to, you know, like because that 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 stuff does really improve performance if you actually kind of visualize and do stuff. Like I remember for my last. Uh, test down at the school for the driving course i got there early and literally walked the course pretending i had a steering wheel like pretending oh, yeah. pretend, pretending i was in the, in the truck like walk to the course pretending how i'm gonna turn the wheel and what i'm you know looking like the entire course like and i was like all right that's what i gotta do and like and like you said with flashcards and stuff too that was um that was a big one about you know how people learn like if anybody has a chance take instructor one course because well I, to me well, it depends how it's given or who it does but like the learning how to learn and how how people learn is super important because some people flashcards are worthless as shit mm -hmm. but that's the standard issue fire department solution for everything is mm -hmm. just flashcard make flashcards study flashcards and some people don't learn that way so learning to like Hey, that's not going to work for me. I need to write it down. I need to, you know, do whatever. So you kind of learn like, Hey, cause like the first area test I messed up cause I got so in the tune of flashcard, bang, 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 bang. When I went to write it down, I was just bang, 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 bang. I didn't think about 
you know, like I failed by right. like two points and there was like four things. It was like, Hey, you were a hundred percent right, but t- where the street starts and where it ends matters. You just put all four of the things down in the wrong spots. So it's like, I can't give you the, the question because you put the wrong street in the wrong spot. So like I slowed it down and actually like rode stuff out, draw, drew little pictures of it instead of just hitting flashcards and, you know, over and over and over. Well, and in the topic of learning, it's also important to realize that your learning style might change as the time goes on. I didn't touch flashcards until I got into the fire service, until I took that test. High school, college, all those, like, I would just sit there, take notes, highlight, and sometimes I was lucky enough that I was able to read the book and understand it. Hell, even through the academy. It wasn't until I got to a driver's test that I had to kind of randomize the thing. And who knows, if I go for anything else, I might have to change how I do things. Maybe it's going to be... I don't know, maybe like record myself if I'm doing some sort of interview. Like it's the important part is don't just assume there's only one way to do it. And if you don't do it well, don't beat yourself for it. If you can't do flashcards, maybe you do notes. If you can't do notes, then maybe highlight like whatever works for you. But just just try it because it is ultimately what you want. And it's going to it's going to get you there. But we have God, we can do an entire learning episode on, on how to get promoted. Right. Let's dive into the reason we are here, and that is the Center for Excellence. You were the first person that, I, out of my circle of friends that I've ever known who, who spent some time there. And we're going to go into the whole journey of getting there, um, the time that you spent there, and, and coming back out. What was there one incident like was there a like hands down this is what did it that you said oh shit i need help or was it a constant build up over 20 plus years in the fire service that got you to the point that you're like ooh i should talk to somebody um so uh, that's a complicated one cuz there was kind of an incident that opened the floodgates for it, but it was also cumulative of it all, you know, it, 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 it was the, you know, standard issue fire department solution of just stuff it down and don't think about it for at that time, 18 years. And when, you know, the dam broke, it was 18 years worth of stuff it down. Don't deal with it. That had built up that all kind of came out at one time. So, you know, there was, you know, red flags before that that I ignored that, you know, probably most people would, <clears throat> you know, sleeping too much, not sleeping enough, drinking, and, you know, just getting anxious about stuff. Like one that I found out later that was like, hey, you know, that's not normal, right? Was like getting really anxious about not being in a driver's seat, like, even with, you know, the, the ex-wife, you know, like if she was driving, I was like, I mean, I'm giving them you know, whatever, but for almost anything, like I just was not comfortable not being in control. And they're like, Hey, you know, that's not a normal thing. I was like, Oh, really? Um, yeah. You can't be a passenger princess if you're right. being anxious about paying the passenger seat. Right. And like, uh, uh, let's see. So it was, New Year's Eve of 2018 when I went in. So that during that year, I had uh, finally, you know, went to finally got the divorce finalized. That didn't didn't take a whole long. That was fairly amicable, pretty pretty easy process. But you know, still, it was just kind of a all right now what you know it's a it's a rough process even if it is amicable even you know even if it's you're not married and you're just breaking up with somebody there's always that kind of like fuck, you know you replay in your head you have you know especially you know the marriage stuff like you know regret that i do the right thing am i good enough i mean whatever so you have that so you know they also kind of standard solution to most of our problems is i'll just put in for much overtime and Got involved, you know, more with teaching and just, just busy, busy, busy. I don't, I'm not taking off. I'll just, 
dive into work. Uh, you know, uh, I've seen these guys who've you know split up before. They're miserable as shit to be around the firehouse with. So I'm not going to be that guy. I'm not going to tell anyone. I'm not going to talk about it to anybody. I'm just going to suck it up. Um, so I was kind of added some stress to things that I wasn't really thinking about. Uh, Dude, and I remember I felt so bad because you had taken this much anticipated trip out west in July of 2018. Right. And I mean, this is something that, that I'm always going to cherish and I'm always going to be thankful for because you cut it short and you were there at, at Nate's memorial. Like it was one like, I looked over and I saw you in class A's. So I was like, Oh my God, he's back. Like he made it back. Um, and while I do like eternally appreciate that, I know it must not have been easy because of all the shit that you have been dealing with and stuffing down for so long, finally having that chance to go out in nature where I know you love and I know you enjoy spending the time and then being like, nope, pack everything up and head back east to um, to go attend a fireman funeral. Yeah, I mean, it. it so that kind of, that, that adds, that, that ties into when I was at the center of, you know, a lot of people on this job, you know, we're here for a reason because we want to help people. We want to be there to support people. We're, we we like to be the person to solve problems, to, you know, help others to, you know, there's a reason why a lot of firemen are in codependent toxic relationships because we're, we're helpers and we, we see a, you know, whether it's a fire or a dumpster fire, we are drawn to it. If you understand what I mean. Yeah, I feel like uh, oh. shots at me. <laughs> Jesus Christ. I'm sitting right here, bro. Hey, friends. I want to take a quick moment to ask you to support the show by leaving a rating and a review on your favorite platform. Your support means the world to us, and it helps spread the message to even more people. We've gotten thousands and thousands of listeners, and those high ratings help our show become more discoverable, allowing us to reach even more listeners and make an even greater impact. So if you've enjoyed what you heard so far, please take a moment to leave a rating and a review. It only takes a few seconds, and it makes a huge difference. Thank you so much, and now let's get back to the show. Um, so, you know, I was just kind of, huh, so what are you supposed to do? It's my boy, you know, there's a got no bunch of guys in Howard, somebody, passed, somebody died, so, you know, hey, head on back. Um, now, while I was out there and, you know, cutting it short, I've got a, got a flight to come back. I stayed in Vegas for one night, which I hate Vegas. It was hot as could be. <laughs> But I'm also kind of a nerd, and they had a uh, like Avengers uh, theme park attraction kind of deal. So I wanted to go check that out. And like the one thing, you know, to start the trip, you like go on this thing, but then like uh, it's almost like a secret size thing. And then like the pretend doors like shut and seal you in there. And then they have some little thing on the display screen. And like I remember just like really tensing up and getting just super nervous and like getting by the exit by the door like getting ready to freak out and the you know little attendee and their little pretend marvel outfit or whatever was like dude you're you all right i'm like just fucking how long is this thing he's like it'll be over in like 30 seconds I'm like, okay <laughs> and like i just like ran out in front of the crowd and got a, got away from everybody and you know that was a big red flag that i was just like man that was weird all right no problem moving on um a few months after that we were in a uh metro tunnel walkthrough down in dc so you know we start at one station the guy takes you down we go over all the stuff you get down like along the side of the track there's you know i don't know for the guys studying for started they could tell you exactly how many but it was like a foot and a half walkway on the side but it's tight yeah so like you know a train comes by everybody put your back up against the wall because if you're sticking out it's gonna smack you so that's kind of that tight yeah, I remember the the before we started heading down. I remember the the guy said, "Hey, you know, if, if this stuff makes you uncomfortable, you can stay at the piece. No big deal." And I'm like, "Yeah, whatever." You know, went down. I've been in tunnels before. You know, back when I was in PG, we used to go down pretty often and drill. I went out to Metro and drill. Did like they'd smoke up the pretend track and train and. But you know, I got about 200 feet in and just palms were sweaty. I was kind of like fucking anxious. Like I was sitting there like holding onto my Tillerman's arm, you know, pressed up against the wall. And like, 
and it, and looking back, like or you know, when I started evaluating, it wasn't that I was in a tunnel. It was that I was like in the middle of a group that I wasn't on the, the end, the either end that like hey, I could get out of here if right. I needed to. And you know, afterward, like that, you know, and when I talked to my lieutenant, you're you know. Now the next year he's like hey, i thought you were fucking with us like pretending that you were freaking out i was like because like you know we got to like the first little like emergency stairwell shaft i was sitting there looking at freedom like can i just leave and the guy's like he's like no you can't just open the gate and do the emergency exit in the middle of the mall in dc and like but I, I need to get the fuck out of here and it's like all right um again another big red flag that i was just like Puh. all right that was weird um so something that never used to bother you that all of a sudden does that's a big red flag don't just brush it off yeah pay that, attention. that's an that's an important one to kind of remember from that journey uh let's see then around thanksgiving i think it was yeah like thanksgiving i was heading to a uh, friend's house for a little get together and i was driving and uh, it just crushed me because it was a little uh like a dog ran out you know wasn't on the phone wasn't texting wasn't doing not paying attention it just cornered my eye saw something tried to swerve ended up you know hitting somebody's dog and killing it and like it just tore me up because you know i got I've my little dog for 13 years now and it's been my little partner in crime and you know going trips and always hanging out and you know i know how much my dog means to me so it just tore me up that you know it was me that you know took it from somebody right. and but the you know, and it also kind of messed me up because, you know, going through divorce and all that stuff and kind of getting treated like shit. Here's this family that I just, you know, killed their their dog, their best friend, and they were like giving me a hug, asking me if I needed to come inside, if my truck was okay, if, you know, they needed me to call somebody. Like, they were just like the most gracious, kind, nice people, and it just, it just messed me up because it was like, here I am. You know, somebody I was married to and supposed to, you know, supposed to be that was flipping out on me because I didn't put the dishes in the right spot and, you know, stuff like that. And here's this complete stranger showing me empathy like that. It just, it just really kind of messed me up. So kind of probably about a month after that, uh, this was the first time I had taken leave in like a year and a half where I just took time while I didn't have like all right, I'm going to take a day off, but I'm going to do this, this, and this, or I'm working, well, you know, whatever. And it got towards the end of that. This was like mid December. It got towards the end of that, that leave time. And I didn't have something to do. And I was just kind of had dead time and working out and got really like lightheaded about, I was lifting or doing something and, you know, like everybody, when you're lifting, if you aren't breathing right or you lock your legs or something and you can kind of get a little, woo, yeah. get a little woozy. Yeah. Down. Uh, and, you know, it happened before, happens, whatever, but just that particular time, it just set me into like a full blown panic and like, like full on panic that I looked at my heart rate thing later on and it talked about, uh, I don't know, one of the EMS nerds said it was a vasal vagal or vagal response or oh, yeah, one, down. one of those terms. <clears throat> but truck guy. It it sent me into a like full on panic attack. I'd never had one before in my life. And, you know, it's a very like holy shit, holy shit, holy shit. Your amygdala's fired up, your fight or flight's kicking in, your and <clears throat> had all these thoughts going through my head about all right, if you if you pass out you're gonna be laying on the floor you probably like piss your pants everybody's gonna stare at you somebody's gonna take a picture and put it on tiktok they're gonna call 911 i know people that work in the baltimore county fire department they're gonna show up it's gonna be super embarrassing you know it's gonna be all these red flags it's gonna da, da, da. so like luckily that year i had been helping teach a uh, like an scba confidence course so we you know i had given this speech you know, 60 times about, you know, setting the, you know, confidence in your brain and all whole stuff and like you know, doing like setting small goals and hyping yourself up and talking yourself through it and don't 
you know, just, Hey, I'm going to get to that bench. All right. I'm going to get to the locker room. I'm going to get my stuff. I'm going to get back out to that bench. I'm going to get to the door. I'm going to get to my truck. So you had those small <laughs> goals and those like little achievable victories that you could kind of, I don't want to say bypass your, your brain, but be like, listen, I know we're in a panic state, but next goal bench. Right. Okay. Breath. Next goal, a locker room. And at least you, you might not be running towards success, but you're at least crawling and moving slowly, but you are moving. Right. And, you know, like I was thankful I had, you know, had that class, you know, I'd helped, I had given that spiel so many times. It was like just immediately kind of defaulted to, and, and, and that's why, you know, we teach it for SUVA failures and stuff too. Like, Hey, something is bad. You can go 20, 30 seconds without air. You have time to try to solve this problem. You got to think about it and slow yourself down and, uh, you know, we've talked to guys who've survived near flashovers. It's like, how'd you get out? And it's like, I didn't try to get out. I tried to get to that door. That's all, you know, like I tried to get to that door and then down that hallway and then to there, you know, like I wasn't thinking about getting out of the building. I was just trying to get five feet each time. So, you know, have this panic attack, get to my truck, get home, you know, freak the hell out. Cause never had one before. And, you know, at that point, your, you know, your amygdala, your fight or flight response is super hyper activated. You're kind of, uh, um, I contacted, uh, uh, one of the guys from rescue squad two that we run with on our shift. Uh, and thankfully a few months before that he had openly said that, you know, he went to go see a therapist because he was having some, some issues and stuff and, you know, it helped him out a lot. So as a guy that I knew that I trusted that I respected mm -hmm. who had said, Hey, I went and got some help cause I was seeing, you know, I had some stuff going on. So I called him, he gave me the, you know, the number of the therapist called him right away. Try to, all right, we'll get you in the next day. Cool. Um, then getting to the therapist, it was definitely one of the hardest things I've ever done, uh, because, you know, it's just, and people, the brains are, brains are dumb, man. Like <laughs> I, I got out of the truck, I got to the sidewalk and I, I, it was like, my legs were concrete. There was an invisible fence. I couldn't, I couldn't move another step. Uh, it was just, I couldn't go any further. So I went back out to my truck, called up there, uh, the therapist actually came out to my truck and stood there. It was like 10 degrees out, but he was just stood there and kind of chatted with me and eventually took, took him about an hour, but he coaxed me up into the place and just, you know, told me stuff like, Hey, you know, sip some water. That'll help. You know, if you're sipping water, your brain's like, all right, well, can't be in that much danger if you're drinking water. All right. Tried that. And, you know, but one of the things that kind of got me out of the truck was he said, uh, oh, what do you think's going to happen up there? And I'm just like, I have no idea. It's terrifying. I don't know what's going to happen up there. I'm like, I, I'm afraid you're going to like hit a button and guys are going to come in with a, you know, uh, you know, uh, the straight jacket, the straight put, jacket in room. put me in a padded room. Well, like, over I, the I, nest. I, I don't know. And he's like, dude, we're just going to talk. That's it. Dude. And if we can pause right at this point, because you touched on it when you talked to the rescue two guy and that sort of crazy expectation that we have that we're going to be ridiculed taken away it, that's why it's so important to as my friends sex says, just fucking talk just talk about it when i started going to therapy back in 2014 and it was kind of annoying because she's like oh yeah i'm diagnosing you with um failure to cope i'm like god damn it i sound like such a snowflake right now but I was very open about I'm seeing somebody, I'm talking to somebody like I go to a dentist, I go to an orthopedist, I get my yearly physical. Why the fuck wouldn't I talk about my brain in the hopes that somebody like you might have listened and been like, you know what? It is okay. It is okay to talk. It is okay to seek that help. And it is okay to think that the, you know, attendants with the straight jacket are going to come in and then get past that and realize that we're the ones doing the work, but it is okay to do that work. Yeah, absolutely. And like, you know, that, 
that first time I was like, all right, cool. You know, he, he, I'll be able to do this. And he, you know, gave me some stuff and, you know, I figured, all right, well, I, I can just, I'm a fireman. I, I did one th- session of therapy. I can figure it out. I don't, I don't, I don't need to do this <laughs> shit anymore. So, you know, I like white knuckled in, like, you know, like I said, my big deal, I was freaking out. I was having this fight or flight response, hardcore, like walking inside a gas station was difficult. Being around people, difficult. Uh, I needed to get groceries. Like you know, like it took me like two hours to like walk into the store. All right, I had to get back in my truck. All right, walk down an aisle. All right, I get back. In your defense, getting groceries is pretty fucking annoying. Yeah, one of my ultimate tests was walking through Wegmans because that. Oh God. Yeah. Um, but you know, it was just. And then, uh, then I was like, all right, well, I'm handling it handle it on my own. I'm a fireman. I can, I can do this. And, and this is talking to that one therapist. Yeah. Just at okay. one time, you know, whatever. And then I went to, or then I was like Christmas Eve and I was, I was like, oh, I'm just, all right, maybe I just need to be at home. I'm still kind of amped up and freaked out, you know? And so all right, I put myself off sick, give myself another couple of days to you know, it's got to be got to be over in a few days. Like, there's no way this is gonna <laughs> gonna be a thing. So, uh, I think I like went to urgent care and he gave me some like Xanax or something. Or I was like, oh, that's what's up, bro. All right, well, fuck, I can handle the bit of this. And he was like, well, you know, you're not really supposed to drive or do that when you're on this. I was like, all right, whatever. <laughs> um, but so I get a sick call and Christmas Eve. Which is a terrible, I was say, probably the worst terrible, time. terrible decision because <laughs> uh, I got there an hour early and there's already about 30 people in line. And by the time they opened the doors, it was like 80, 90 guys because, you know, quote, uh, cough, cough. Everyone magically got sick that day. Yeah, dude. Pre COVID. Oh. Um, Pre Christmas COVID. <clears throat> and, uh, you know, so I'm in this little room, like, you know, 80 people standing there. I got my little number and I'm like, sweating pacing trying to like hide myself in a corner and i looked over and uh, one of the kids who i think he had like two years three years on the job at that time uh he was one of my the engine probationer but one of the younger kids that i had and i had told him when he first like first day like hey man you know you're gonna see stuff that's gonna mess you mess with you no shame in getting help no shame in talking to anybody you know i'm not gonna judge you no big deal it's important and he was just kind of staring at me and staring at me and while I'm sitting there, they're freaking out. And he, he walked over and was like, hey, dude, you, you, you all right? And I was just like, fuck. Like, he called me, you know, like, yeah, he, it, he, you. He, he like didn't, you know, he didn't call me out or anything, but it was just like, I can't be a fucking, I, I can't be a hypocrite. Right. You got to practice what you, you know, I'm like, I hear it just hit me that I'm just like. I told this kid if he's having problems, it's not a big deal to talk to somebody. And here I am trying to bullshit my way through. I'm not having a problem. Um, you know, so on top of that, uh, that hyper vigilance and stuff like that, I was, uh, I was also dealing with some like, uh, some flashbacks some pretty like vivid, terrible flashbacks of things I hadn't thought about and had stuffed down you know, 17, 18 years prior to that. So it was pretty freaking me out. Like, you know, you're sitting there in bed, curled up in a ball, tense, having a vivid flashback about, you know, nasty fire, but, you know, burnt up kid, you know, 18 years ago that you had, you had that until then had tucked away and never thought about. So I go in and I'm sitting there, you know, again, kind of, rocking back and forth like a crazy person, you know, sweating and the lady comes in and, you know, this is her 30th, you know, Oh, my tummy hurts. Okay. Here's a day off. And she walks in. She's like, Oh, what's going on? I'm like, uh, yeah, my stomach. And she like looks up from her paperwork and sees me like sitting there sweating and like, you know, clenching my hands, like freaking out. And she's like, uh, you sure that's all that's wrong with you young man? I'm like, oh, God damn it. Uh, caught again. No, no, uh, I'm fucked up. I need to, uh, I need to go talk to the, the behavioral health people. He's like, okay. So he gives me an appointment and then, uh, you know, I'm sitting in my truck like, fuck, this is it. Career's over. I'm going to go talk to the, 
therapist. They're going to, you know, put a stamp on it. I'm going to get, you know, handing out staplers at the logistics for the rest of my, the rest of my time. They're not going to let me do nothing. And, uh, sweet little old lady, she's like, you know, talk to her for a little bit. And she's like, all right, well, just continue, you know, go see your therapist again and take a couple shifts off. All right. That that's it. She's like, yeah, I thought this was like where you fix me. Yeah. But, but it was just like, you know, but, but not even that. I was like, I thought this was like the worst case scenario was a sweet little old lady being like, okay, take a couple of days off and come back and, you know, just keep seeing your therapist. And like, all right. Like, you're not going to like, you know, again, put me in a straight jacket and throw me in a rubber room. It's like, no happens all the time. <laughs> and like, Oh, it, it, but also it, that's something that actually pissed me off to talking to her. Uh, one of the incidents we had that I told her about, I got three sentences in and she stopped me and said, Oh, I know all about that one. It's so terrible. I'm like, what, what? She's like, Oh yeah. After that incident, MPD sent all their police officers to come see oh, us no. and you know, get put them off to you know get counseling and stuff and you guys got none of that we got a person who had you know the four-hour peer support got back you know before peer support actually like really yeah. did anything was it yeah. like the system class or something yeah and yeah she had come up to the firehouse got everybody in the room and said uh does this call bother anybody and the you know lieutenant with 20 years on and said nope if this is something that bothers you this job's not for you and you can't hack it so of course, all the guys with you know, right? That's lovely. A couple of years on, are like, uh, yeah, yeah, nothing, nothing about me. I'm fine. I'm just shit. You know, like, in case you're missing the sarcasm as you're listening to this, do not ever do that. Especially if you're in a position of leadership, you do not speak for your people like that. Uh, yeah, and, and uh, yeah, so that that one kind of kind of frustrated me because you know, oh, cool, the police sent all their people right afterwards and handled it and they're, she's like yeah i still see something about it i'm like huh what do you know uh so after that i went to went i ended up seeing a different therapist because it was christmas time and i was like this is not working you know i, I hit him up and a different guy was like on duty so i got with him and he he did the uh the rapid eye movement stuff. EDMR. Yeah. Rapid, rapid, eye, rapid eye movement therapy. So that's like, it's like some voodoo magic they do. They, they figured out that when you sleep and your, your REM sleep, when your brain's like processing everything, they like some of some scientists like saw somebody doing it at night and kind of figured out, Hey, those eye movements is like a certain pattern. So they kind of like have you sit there and like move your eyes a certain way talk about this incident, you know, talk about this, you know, uh, this flashback, this image in your head, this bad thing. And it kind of really dredges stuff up. So like, it's, it's not for the faint of heart. It will drain you out because it digs up stuff from your brain that you've been kind of suppressing. So it kind of empties it out. But at the end of it, they kind of switch the pattern that your eyes are moving and kind of talk you through it and kind of help you reassign or actually assign a feeling or something about that trauma or that flashback in your head or whatever. So it kind of dumps it out, but it also helps you pack it away in a correct way. So that image kind of fades away and fades away and it's like, all right, check. I dealt with it. So it's a, it's a great tool. If there's a therapist around you that does it, definitely recommend it. You and it seems silly, but you almost need somebody to drive you because when you're done, you're going to be just mentally just taxed. Like it'll drain you out. Um, the second time I did it was on my birthday on December 28th. And that one worked, but it also kind of just broke open the floodgates. So like I like went to leave got down the stairs, which is a challenge. But like, then I was like, I getting out of the hallway was freaking me out. So I went back up, curled up on the ball, sat there. So he told me like, just sleep for like an hour. But then afterwards he was like, Hey man, you, um, you really need to go to the, to the IFF center. And he's like, you know, we can, we can do this, you know, twice a week for the next six years. 
I'm trying to figure all this shit out or, you know, you really need to consider does intensive kicking your, you know, kicking yourself into the deep end for, you know, a month to untangle all this shit. And so like, that's where the, the center really works. Cause it is a, it's helping you, you know, the, the analogy I used or that was told me was it's like your, uh, or like I always use a reference from a Christmas vacation movie where he's got a big tangled ball of Christmas lights and mm-hmm. you know, he's got Rusty trying to untangle it. And, you know, it's like, so you're, you're trying to find a broken bulb in a big tangled mess of Christmas lights. Cause it's not just the fire service. It's your whole life up until that point, all the bad shit, all the stuff, all the things that have made you, you, all the things that have affected you and just one big mess. And it's not easy to figure out what bulbs are broken. So like the IFF center was something that kind of untangled the lights and showed you where it's at. You still had to do the work and you still had to continue on with it afterwards, but it just kind of helps, you know, declutter it a bit. So a little easier to find. Right. Um, what about, so you're at the point that you decided to go there. I remember that Adam drove you there, got you taken care of. Tell me about that initial experience, because we've talked about this before, and it's, I think it's so important because it highlights our, our brotherhood and why it's so important to be in a place of growth and recovery with fellow firefighters. Um, uh, so before I, I talk about that, the uh, kind of the night before I decided to make the phone call, um, I was sitting at my parents, you know, it's Christmas time and all that. And I was just kind of sitting there by myself and I got to, you know, I, I kind of had the realization or that, that kind of, all right, I need to do, I need to do this because, you know, I haven't, I've never had like suicidal ideations but I a hundred percent understand why people get there because when you're in that spot, when your brain is freaking out, when you're have depression, you know, cause of this anxiety or cause of this stuff and you're just really low in that spot, it feels like you're never getting out of it. And that is your reality now and it'll never get better. And it's like, I can, I can understand why some guys, choose that route you know and it's it's a shame but you feel uniquely broken you feel uniquely alone you know even though like i said i'm sitting there at my parents house with a loving family with support but i feel you know you feel like alone in the world and it's never getting better even though people give a shit and people care it's hard to wrap your head around that but it it's you know so like i said i understand it and dc had had uh, two suicides or i'm sorry they had a suicide a little bit before that and um so next day got on the phone sat there for you know an hour or two thinking about it uh i'd had a guy from dc who had been a recent attendee at the center called me up and talked to me kind of gave me the little extra push to help me out with it you know called uh it's a it's a busy time of year for them new year's a lot of people that are you know the new year's resolution kind of all right i'm gonna get myself fixed or you know as, as we all know in the fire service the holidays always bring out the best in people so it's a stressful time in general the jolliest time of the year but uh, they were able to get me in. I had a friend of mine from Baltimore County Fire Department, uh, Adam, volunteered to drive me down there. Uh, you know, again, freaking out because I'm just just being in a room with other people. Uh, we pull up, and you know, the first guy to meet me was uh, he's from North Carolina. Met me at the door. He was a firefighter. He was a on truck 11 down there so they somebody had told him oh you know it's like oh you know what did you, when did you see another truck guy when you walked in you know help you feel better and all right and then, you know it's a it, it's it's for addiction 
but it's also for mental health stuff. So you do have to wrap your head around, you know, if you're going in there, it's, you, you kind of have to play the game, I guess, or just deal with the fact that, Hey, they're going to, they're going to check through your bags and check through your stuff. Make sure you're not hiding any drugs in there make sure you're not smuggling anything. Um, you know, one of the guys I was in the, like the first like night or two is in like the nurse's station. They have like bunks up there and, you know, he said when he, you could drive yourself there if you wanted to, but he, uh, he said, you know, he drove himself and he said there was a guy, you know, waiting outside the gate who told him that, you know, Hey, hey when you see this guy, tell him I'm out, out by this fence, you know, it was just the guy's drug dealer trying, oh, to, wow. trying to get a hold of him to drop some drugs off to him. So like, you know, you got to understand some, some guys are there for, serious you know drug problems and you know hey that might not be what i'm in here for but hey i'll play the game because this is gonna help them right uh you know you like your medical intake review you know they check in and all that you know i had to excuse myself a few times i got and get some air because you know being in a room and uh i remember that was remember one thing that made me laugh was uh you know the one of the like orderlies or aides or whatever came over with the, with the or I guess he's a nurse. I can't remember. But he I, had, say, he, I think order releases is from like the fifties, bro. Whatever. He had a clipboard and he's like, he's like, Hey man, do you, uh, you take gummies or smoke weed or anything? And I was like, I could use one of them. Now I don't, but I, I'm, <laughs> you, and he's like, yeah, I'm, I'm not offering. I'm just, the, the, there's like a trace, you know, maybe might be a false positive, but it says marijuana. I'm like, <laughs> oh, shit. All right. <laughs> I'm not offering. <laughs> um, so, you know, I mean, it's, it's a very like, holy fuck, this is real. You know, but you know, everybody tells you like your first day, a couple of days, like, Hey man, just, just give it a couple of days. You, I need, you know, I'm sure everything in is telling you just, I don't need this. Uh, get out of here. Like, this is very weird. You know, you turn your cell phone in, you, you know, all that stuff. Cause they don't want distractions. They don't want people, you know, calling to, offer drugs or set up a meet or, you know, do whatever. So, you know, you get like access to your cell phone, like once, twice a week, you know, you can still call from a landline or if you have kids, you know, whatever that they, they obviously they let you, you know, let them call home and do stuff. But I, I actually really liked not having a phone. Um, I think, I think after the first week when they're like, you know, oh, it's cell phone time or whatever. And I went to a, you know, get it and turned it on. And, you know, when it cycled up, it was just like notification, 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 notification. Oh, no. I just turned it off and handed it back to the lady. And I'm like, I'm good. And she's like, you, you just got it. And I'm like, I'm good. Like, <laughs> um, but you know, you're at the little nurse's sit station, like your first night and, you know, everybody's kind of filing in there to get their, their pills. Like it's a assisted living home. And, you know, you kind of get to meet everybody and, you know, it's, it's pretty cool. And like, they're, they're very adamant about do not suffer in silence. If you have trouble sleeping, say something and take this pill to knock you out. You know, sleep is super important. All of you here probably have screwed up sleep schedules, probably struggle with stuff. Knock yourself out. Your brain needs to calm down and reset. So I think I forget what sleep thing I took, but you know, it was like, phew. and like, that was a, that was a big one for me. I, I was in bed by like nine thirty every night. One of the like nighttime supervisor, whatever they call them, people like at the end of it, they do like a little like, Oh yeah, remember this? And remember how you did that? And no, oh, you know, whatever. And when I got to that little guy, it's like, I don't even know who you are, dude. You were asleep every night. I never even met you. <laughs> it's like, it's like, yeah, yeah, it was, it was beautiful. Like going to bed at nine o'clock and waking up at seven, like, oh, that sounds amazing. you know, for, for a month straight. Like I was just like, holy shit, this is how normal people feel. And you know, it, so they like, they have like three or four little like houses with a bunch of different, like so it's very kind of fire apartment adjacent. They have like little, like, you know, like a house with, couple little like separate little bunk rooms like three or four or you know how many to a little little bunk mm-hmm. and you know you get a locker so you bring your clothes you know there's laundry machine there's a little kitchen uh you know the cafeteria where you know you get three meals a day 
which is awesome. Also, not having to think about what am I going to cook for breakfast, what am I going to cook for dinner. So that was a that was a nice treat. Um, and then it's you know like they have individual therapy, they have group therapy, uh, they have a lot of like kind of kind of almost like seminars, but all their classes, but they're almost like seminars too, where they they talk talk about a lot of different topics that are unfortunately pretty foreign to men and especially firemen you know like communication skills and you know it's a might be like you know people might think it's like a new age hippie thing but like you know like love languages and stuff like that like how to actually say hey some people don't like getting gifts or don't like this or that's how they show their appreciation to you that they're not touchy feely but they give you a little present you know like there's like different you know kind of just to teach you how to like oh this is how you're supposed to talk to someone else like uh, which one of those classes do you feel benefited you the most um i mean definitely the trauma group um one of the best classes was uh lady remy did uh class on codependency Mm. so she puts out this like questionnaire and it's like all right check check everything that applies to you and she's like all right you know raise your hand if you circled you know 20 of these things a couple guys are you know raise their hand all right what if you did 10 all right you know, rest of the people raise their hand. All right, what if you had four? You know, a couple guys raise it. You know, what if you only had two? You know, one or two guys raise it. And she's like, all right, if you checked any of those boxes, you're inclined for codependent toxic relationships. Oh, damn. It's like, oh. And, you know, just, you know, and it really broke down to like, you know, again, what most people are drawn to in the fire service is I like to help people. I feel that I have to help people when I'm involved with that process. And if I'm not helping someone that I'm not worthy or like, so like we kind of are drawn to these like codependent or toxic relationships where it makes me feel good that this person needs me, you know, that kind of stuff. Yeah. Damn. Um, <clears throat> so the, so I said, there's a lot of good, good little like, huh? All right. Uh, the trauma group was just amazing. Uh, we had, yeah, you know, they have. It's not as many people. It's probably like a dozen, dozen guys and girls. There's some some ladies there. Um, most of the people there average about fifteen to twenty years on on their department, and most of them were drivers and officers. So rewind. You're telling me that it's mostly the guys who have been there for a long time. Yes, uh, there was a handful of you know just a few years, but a lot of it was. You know, guys with similar time on or more. Because I remember when the center first opened up and we as firemen like to really cut each other down and to shit on the new age hippie stuff. And I remember hearing a lot of the comments. It was like, oh, you know, this new generation who can't hack it is going to use that as an excuse not to be at work. Oh, this is all just are going to do it to um all right. to get a paycheck and, and not have to do any work. So to me, it's eye opening that it is that generation that was usually doing the the bad mouthing, or who realized, no, we need help too. Well, that was uh, there was there was one guy there. He was only there for like a week when I first got there because he was like finishing up his time. He was a retired, maybe a captain, I think, from Baltimore County, and great dude. But you know, and he said he's like i wish everyone in the fire service came through this place at some point in their career and this should be like mandatory before retirement he's like i you know did my 30 years retired got the beach house in south carolina and two months later i was just sitting on the porch bawling my eyes out and Mm. all the stuff that you know i hadn't dealt with I'm not around the firehouse anymore. I don't have that distraction. I don't have guys, you know, to joke around with or talk about stuff with. And just everything just kind of hit me. And he's like, I, we do a terrible job of preparing people for after the fire service or when things slow down, all that stuff. Um, 
So the, but the like the trauma group specifically was excellent because it really kind of exposed that it's not it's not necessarily the horrific thing that you saw. It's who you are as a person, your life experiences, what made you who you are, et cetera, et cetera impacts your outlook or your view of the world and what you do and yada yada so somebody who was you know abused as a kid or had a hard time growing up or something like that kind of over identifies themselves as wanting to protect children so when they see a horrific call involving a child that affects them way worse or they had this relationship or this happened to them as a child so it really kind of exposed how you know, four people on a fire apparatus can go to go to a call, and three of them doesn't even phase them one bit. Wouldn't think anything other, but one of the people on there, it might totally, sh- you know, shake their foundation because it's something that was tied to their life or they, you know, they mentally just impacted them more than others. Hey everyone, it's TJ here from Keep the Promise. As you know, this podcast is all about helping firefighters become more resilient and well-rounded so that they can be a force for good within their fire department and their community. But today I want to talk to you about something that's just as important, and that is supporting firefighters who are going through tough times. When one of our fellow firefighters is off work because they have to go to the Center for Excellence, they have to go to rehab, they have mental health issues, or they have other health issues, It really takes away their support system, and it wreaks havoc on their finances and their family's finances. And many times, these brothers and sisters are left to struggle alone, away from their support system and the people who love them without the resources they need to recover. That's why I'm setting a bold new goal, and that is to reach 150 total patrons on Patreon so that we can start a fund to help firefighters and their families during these challenging times. And I need your help to make it happen. With your support on Patreon, we'll be able to provide financial assistance to firefighter families who are battling things like addiction, depression, and cancer. We're going to help alleviate the financial strain that can come with being away from the fire department so that our brothers and sisters can focus on healing and recovering. Now, reaching 150 total patrons is a big goal, but I believe that we can do it together. And when we do will be able to make a real difference in the lives of those who serve and protect alongside us. So, if you're not already a patron, I invite you to join us today. Head over to joinkeepthepromise.com and sign up today. Again, that is joinkeepthepromise.com. And if you already are a patron, thank you so much for your support. You'll be receiving some exclusive rewards and perks as a way of saying thanks. Together, let's show our fellow firefighters that we've got their back, just like they always have ours. Thank you for listening. Let's get started with the episode. 